do you actually achieve temperatures below liquid helium temperatures? Right, so this is a phenomenally fascinating topic because the way you do it is you use a machine that is looking like a bunch of pipes and tubes and solder joints and, and metal flanges, but it's actually entirely quantum mechanical. What it's based upon is the idea of zero point motion. Okay? Even at absolute zero, things do not stand still because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay? If something has a very well-defined position, it cannot have a very well-defined momentum, which means it must move. So in the end, you get something that are somewhat undefined in position and somewhat undefined in momentum. So essentially, they vibrate. Now, how much they vibrate depends on their mass. So given a certain zero-point energy, a lighter particle will vibrate more than a heavier particle. So at, let's say, absolute zero, let's take a helium-3 atom, which is, of course, 25% lighter than a helium-4 atom. The helium-3 atom will wiggle around by some amount, let's say. We'll do something like this. The helium-4 atom will wiggle as well, but a bit less, okay? because it's heavier. So now you ask yourself, what is the attractive force between, let's say, two helium-3 atoms and a helium-3 and a helium-4? The attractive force between helium atoms is extremely weak. Helium is a um, noble gas. So in fact, it doesn't interact with anything. It doesn't ever make chemical compounds with anything. But when you put two helium atoms very, very close together, they actually slightly attract each other. Very, 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 very slightly. Is it like a Van der Waals type thing? It's exactly a Van der Waals force. But that, that depends very strongly on the distance. So what you'll find is that the attractive force, the attractive Van der Waals force between helium-3 and helium-4 is a little bit stronger than that between two identical helium-3 atoms, okay? Because the helium-3 can come a little bit closer to the helium-4. Because it's not wiggling around as much. Exactly. So then, what you do to exploit this, to go to very low temperatures, is the following. Take a bucket and you fill it up with a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. And you liquefy that mixture. Okay? What you would expect is that you have the helium-3 floating on the top, because it's lighter, and then you'll have the helium-4 at the bottom. Because of the fact that the helium-3 is more attracted to the helium-4 than it is to another helium-3, in fact, what you'll find is that some helium-3 atoms will spontaneously dilute themselves, will go and sit into the part where there is helium-4. In fact, you'll find that the concentration is 6.4% the equilibrium concentration. Okay? So at absolute zero, there is 6.4% helium-3 that spontaneously dissolves into helium-4. The next thing you do is that you shape it in the form of a U-tube, not as in <laughs> the, the channel U-tube, but a tube in the shape of a U, like this. Okay? So let's say you do this. And you fill this up with this mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. So what you'll find is that, let's say, on one side, you will have your pure helium-3 side. And then the rest is the helium-4 with a little bit of helium-3 in it, 6.4%. Okay? Now, the next thing you do is you connect a pump to this U-tube. So you connect a pump that basically pumps away from the right-hand side and re-injects to the left-hand side. The point here is that helium-3 and helium-4 are like alcohol and water. Like when you distill your own vodka or, or some other liquor <laughs> of your preference, effectively what you do, you heat up this, this starting material you have, and the alcohol has a lower boiling point than the water, so the alcohol vapors will come out. That's how you distill booze, right? And here you're doing the same thing. You're distilling helium-3 out of helium-4. Helium-3 has a lower boiling point than helium-4. So if the temperatures are right, what you'll find is that there is only helium-3 that comes out of here. Okay? The helium-4 stays where it is, and the helium-3 comes up, just like alcohol. Now, as you extract helium-3 atoms from the right-hand side, 
you are reducing the concentration in this region, right? So here you may have, you know, 2 or 3 percent helium-3 only. So what's going to happen is that you have an osmotic pressure that drives the helium-3 from this side, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, to balance out the concentration. But here you have the interface with the pure helium-3 that floats at the top. So now, if you're taking away helium-3 from here, you will have new helium-3 atoms that can jump into the helium-4 helium phase. And as they do so, they actually absorb heat. Because the entropy is increasing when you take atoms from a pure phase into a dilute phase, this substance around here, around this interface, is absorbing heat. But if you connect something else, for example, a spin qubit device, <laughs> to this part here, so you bolt something interesting, some interesting experiment to this YouTube at this point, it means that heat will be taken away from your experimental apparatus and dumped into this circulating flow of helium-3. So um, let's take the example of the soup that we were talking about before. So you've made yourself a nice bowl of hot soup, but it's too hot can't eat it yet. So what do you do? You blow on it. Right? When you blow on it, effectively you are trying to disturb the equilibrium vapor concentration above the soup. Right? If the soup is really at 100 degrees, the water would like to have one atmosphere of vapors above it. Right? Of course, it's in air, it's not in a vacuum chamber, so that vapor would blow away. But if you actually blow on the soup, you are you know, increasing the carrying away of the disordered part of the liquid vapor mixture, right? So the vapor is the disordered part, the entropic part, and the liquid is the more ordered part. So by blowing on the soup, you're doing like what we're doing here. You're taking away the disordered parts of the system, like taking away the helium-3 from here, and then what's going to happen is that some atoms from the ordered side, which is the pure liquid, are going to jump into the disorder phase, just like water molecules in your soup are going to evaporate more quickly if you blow on it. And as you do so, you're actually cooling down the soup mm. because you're taking away energetic and disordered particles from the liquid into a phase that is then removed. How cold can you get this? Uh, in our laboratory, we get to about 20 millikelvin. The record, to the best of my knowledge, is 1.9 millikelvin. One thing you might find interesting is that this technique, so the dilution refrigerator technique that I just described, is being used in Leiden, indeed, to cool down a gravitational wave antenna. So what they are doing there, they are taking a 65 centimeter, which means one and a half ton in weight, sphere of copper aluminum alloy, and with this technique, they are cooling it down to 20 millikelvin to detect the change in the shape of this sphere when a gravitational wave passes by, for example, because a supernova has imploded. So an object as big and, as, and massive as a 65 centimeter, one and a half ton copper aluminum sphere will essentially shrink and expand upon passing of a gravitational wave by probably about 10 to the minus 20 meters, which is less than a billionth of the size of an atom. It's actually smaller than the size of a nucleus. <laughs> Sounds like a silly thing to try and measure. Yeah, and yet you can. So they have these sensors, which are of course based on quantum mechanics, that can detect a displacement of about 10 to the minus 21 meters. So they got about, you know, factor 10 extra range to tell whether that ball, which is being cooled down by this method to 20 millikelvin, is actually expanding and, and, and shrinking because of the passage of a gravitational wave. So this is one, just one example of the million things you can do with low temperature techniques. Why does it need to be that cold? Oh, because otherwise you would have thermal vibrations of its own that essentially, you know, are much larger than the vibrations due to the gravitational wave passing by. My advice sounds so simple. I mean, just start making videos. So why don't we? Why does everyone find it so difficult? Well, the answer is you want to make something that's good. You want to make something that's popular, that everyone likes. And you're worried that, what if you 